usually introduce my work, but by way of context, this is a long poem. I performed a shorter version at the International Congress Against the Death Penalty that was at the European Parliament in Belgium. Now forget I said that. On April 29th, 2014, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections carried out the legal execution of offender Clayton D. Lockett, number 206-409. The information provided below is a timeline of events leading up to offender Lockett's death. We begin with the principle, settled by Greg, that capital punishment is constitutional. C-429 U.S. at 177, joint opinion of Stewart, Powell, and Stevens. It necessarily follows that there must be a means of carrying it out. This court has never invalidated a state's chosen procedure for carrying out a sentence of death as the infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. The lawfulness of the death penalty is not before us. 506 hours. The Correctional Emergency Response Team, CERT, arrives at offender Lockett's cell to escort to medical for x-rays as part of the execution protocol. Lockett refuses orders to be restrained. What's the difference between a lawyer and God? God doesn't think he's a lawyer. 509, CERT team exits unit in preparation for cell entry. Some risk of pain is inherent in any method of execution, no matter how humane, if only from the prospect of error and following the required procedure. It is clear, then, that the Constitution does not demand the avoidance of all risk of pain in carrying out executions. Petitioners do not claim that it does. 0550, CERT team and medical personnel on unit to conduct planned use of force. After giving a verbal order to be restrained, a friend or locker refused, and an electric shock taser was administered. Punishments are cruel when they involve torture or lingering death, but the punishment of death is not cruel within the meaning of that word as used in the Constitution. It implies that there is something inhuman and barbarous, something more than the mere extinguishment of life. Id at 477, 10, Supreme Court, 930. 0553, offender locket was taken to H medical room where it was found that he had a self-injected, inflicted laceration to his right arm. Treatment was administered. Offender Lockhart was then transported by vehicle to the medical facility, Intermediate Healthcare Center, IHCC, at Oklahoma State Penitentiary. What's the best thing about the death penalty? Fewer Americans. 0645. Offender Lockhart arrives at IHCC for treatment of self-inflicted injuries, which were observed during the cell extraction at 0550 hours. 0645. Offender Lockhart was moved to an observation cell in IHCC. Medical personnel examined Offender Lockhart's self-inflicted wounds. Three officers were assigned continuous observation until 1719 hours. Simply because an execution method may result in pain, either by accident or as an inescapable consequence of death, does not establish the sort of objectively intolerable risk of harm that qualifies as cruel and unusual. In Louisiana, X. Rel. Francis v. Webster, 329 U.S. 459, 67 Supreme Court, 374, 91, Lawyer's Edition, 422, 1947, a plurality of the court upheld a second attempt at execu executing a pr prisoner by electrocution after a mechanical malfunction had interfered with the first attempt. The principal opinion noted that accidents happen for which no man is to blame. Id at 462, 67 Supreme Court, 734, and concluded that such an accident with no suggestion of malevolence id at 463, 67 Supreme Court, 374, did not give rise to an Eighth Amendment violation, id at 463, 464, 67 Supreme Court, 747. 0700 to 01815, 
The fender locker was checked by the cell watch team accompanied by medical personnel every 15 minutes. 0815, physician's assistant examined a fender locker and determined that sutures were not needed. 0840, a fender locker was returned to observation cell in IHCC. In applying these standards to the facts of this case, we note at the outset that it is difficult to regard a practice as objectively intolerable when it is, in fact, widely tolerated. 36 states that sanction capital punishment have adopted lethal injection as the preferred mode of injection. The federal government uses lethal injection as well. 0850 to 0935, offender locker was checked by the cell watch team every 15 minutes. 0915 approximately, a fender locker refused visits from his attorneys. 0942, a fender locker was offered a food tray and refused the food tray. After losing his appeal, the defendant turns to his lawyer and says, so where do we go from here? The lawyer says, you, prison, me, lunch. 0955 to 1045, cell watch team checked offender locket every 15 minutes. 1025 approximately, offender locket confirmed his refusal to visit with his attorneys. What's the difference between an accountant and a lawyer? Accountants know they're boring. 1111, offender locket was offered a food tray and refused the food tray. 1135 to 1450, cell watch team checked offender locket every 15 minutes. 1510 to 1555, cell watch team checked offender locket every 15 minutes. How do you tell if a lawyer is well hung? You can't get a finger between the rope and his neck. How do you get a lawyer down from a tree? Cut the rope. We are left then with retribution as the primary rationale for imposing the death penalty. And indeed, it is retribution rationale that animates much of the remaining enthusiasm for the death penalty. Our Eighth Amendment jurisprudence has narrowed the class of offenders eligible for the death penalty to include only those who have committed outrageous crimes defined by specific aggravating factors. It is the cruel treatment of victims that provides the most persuasive arguments for prosecutors seeking the death penalty. A natural response to such heinous crimes is a thirst for vengeance. As the inmate was strapped into the electric chair, he said, I'm so scared. His lawyer nodded sympathetically and asked if he had any last requests. The prisoner smiled slightly and said, all I ask is that you hold my hand. 1610 to 1640, restraint team escorts offender locker from IHCC to H unit SW shower, final holding cell prior to execution. In an attempt to bring executions in line with our evolving standards of decency, we have adopted increasingly less painful methods of execution and then declared previous methods barbaric and archaic but by requiring that an execution be relatively painless, we necessarily protect the inmate from enduring any punishment that is comparable to the suffering inflicted on his victim. This trend, while appropriate and required by the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment, actually undermines the very premise on which public approval of retribution rationale is based. 1655 to 1710, Offender locker visits with mental health personnel. So you're in a room with Hitler, Stalin, and a lawyer, and you have a gun with two bullets. Who do you shoot? The lawyer, twice. 1719, offender locker was escorted from SW shower to the execution chamber by Warden Trammell and the restraint team. How do you stop a lawyer from drowning? Shoot him before he hits the water. 1722, offender locker was placed and restrained on the execution table. 1727 to 1818, phlebotomist enters execution chamber to determine appropriate placement for IV. The phlebotomist examined offender locker's left and right arms, left and right legs, and both feet to locate a viable insertion period. No viable point of entry was located. 
The doctor then examined the offender's neck and then went to the groin area. What do you get when you put 50 lawyers in a room with 50 lesbians? 100 people who don't do dick. I take no position on the desirability of the death penalty except to say its value is eminently debatable and the subject of deeply, indeed passionately held views, which means to me that it is preeminently not a matter to be resolved here, and especially not when it is explicitly permitted by the Constitution. You may need a new lawyer when you meet him in prison. The prosecutor high fives him. He giggles when he hears the word briefs. He calls the judge the one with the little hammer. Instead of objecting, he says, whatever. He gives juror number four the finger. The prison guard is shaving your head. 5.40 PM. Inmates can be heard banging loudly on cell doors throughout death row, which prison officials explain as a sign of respect for the inmate about to be executed. Not all inmates receive such a standoff. It just depends on whether other inmates liked the condemned inmate. 1818, the IV insertion process is complete. Insertion point was covered with a sheet to prevent the witnesses viewing of the groin area. 1820, phlebotomist exits the execution chamber. Another serious concern is that the risk of error in capital cases may be greater than in other cases because the facts are so often disturbing that the interest in making sure the crime does not go unpunished may overcome residual doubts concerning the identity of the offender. Our former emphasis on the importance of ensuring that decisions in death cases be adequately supported by reason rather than emotion, Gardner, 430 U.S. 349, 97 Supreme Court, 1197, 51 Lawyers Edition, 2nd, 393, has been undercut by more recent decision, placing a thumb on the prosecutor's side of the scales. 1823, Warden Trammell receives approval to proceed with the execution from Director Patton. Shades and execution chamber are raised. Offender Lockhart was given the opportunity to make a final statement and declined. Warden Trammell begins the execution. Mysodolum is administered intravenously. Finally, given the real risk of error in this class of cases, the irrevocable nature of the consequence is of decisive importance to me. Whether or not any in innocent defendants have actually been executed, abundant evidence accumulated in recent years has resulted in the exoneration of an unacceptable number of defendants found guilty of capital offenses. 6.23 p.m. The beige blinds covering four windows to the execution chamber raised and the execution is about to begin, 23 minutes past its scheduled time. This execution has taken a longer time to start than the three others I've covered and other media witnesses remark on the slow start as well. Warden Anita Trammell asks Lockett, covered up to his shoulders by a white sheet, whether he has any last words. No, is all he says. This is an especially surprising Earlier, Lockhart rejected his last meal after being told he couldn't have a particular kind of steak. Let the execution begin, Trammell says. What prompts Justice Stevens to repudiate his prior view and adopt the astounding position that a criminal sanction is expressly mentioned in the Constitution violates the Constitution? His analysis begins with what he believes to be the uncontroversial legal premise that the extinction of life with only marginal contributions to any discernible social or public purposes would be patently excessive and violative of the Eighth Amendment. Ante at 1550, quoting in part Furman, Supra at 312, 92 Supreme Court, 2726, White concurring. See also Ante at 1546 to 1547, citing Greg Supra at 183, and Note 28, 96 Supreme Court, 2909. Even if that were uncontroversial in the abstract, and it certainly not occurs to me as the meaning of cruel and unusual punishments, it is assuredly controversi controversial, indeed flat out wrong, as applied to a mode of punishment that is explicitly sanctioned by the Constitution. What's the difference between a lawyer and a terrorist? You can negotiate with a terrorist. 6.28 p.m., 
50 milligrams of mesodolum have been injected into each of Lockett's arms to start the process and attempt to sedate him before the second and third drugs are administered to start the breathing and the heart. Lockett has spent the sat let past several minutes blinking and occasionally pursing his lips. 6.29 p.m. Lockett's eyes are closed and his mouth is open slightly. 6.31 p.m. The doctor checks Lockett's pupils and places his hand on the inmate's chest, shaking him slightly. Mr. Lockett is not unconscious, Trammell states. 18.30, doctor checked offender Lockett for consciousness. Offender was still conscious. Although I agree that petitioners have failed to establish that Kentucky's lethal injection protocol violates the Eighth Amendment, I write separately because I cannot subscribe to the plurality's opinions formulation of the governing standard. 1833, doctor checked offender locket for consciousness. Offender was unconscious. Berconium bromide is administered intravenously. Potassium chloride is administered intravenously. It is undisputed that the second and third drugs used in Kentucky's three drug le lethal injection protocol pancronium bronide and potassium chloride would cause a conscious inmate to suffer excruciating pain. If the drug is injected too quickly, the increase in blood pressure can cause the inmate's veins to burst after a small amount of sodium thenopentol has been administered, CF app 215, describing risk of blowout. Kentucky's protocol does not specify the rate at which sodium thenopentol should be injected the executioner who does not have any medical training pushes the drug by feel through five feet of tubing, id at 284, 286 to 287. Facing the death penalty, I was hoping my lawyer could get me a last minute stay of execution. As they were strapping me in, he came bursting through the door. Well, there's good news and bad news, he said. Give me the bad news first, I said. Unfortunately, I've not been able to get you off, he said. Oh, fuck, I sighed, so what's the good news? I've managed to get your dosage reduced. 6.33 p.m. The doctor checks Lockett a second time after a full minute without movement. Mr. Lockett is unconscious, Trammell states. It seems like it took longer than expected for this to occur. In past executions I've attended, there's been no notice that the inmate was unconscious, just a pronouncement of death after about eight minutes without much reaction from the inmate. 6.36 p.m., Lockett kicks his right leg and his head rolls to one side. He mumbles something we can't understand. 6.37 p.m., the inmate's body starts writhing and buckling and it looks like he's trying to get up. Both arms are strapped down and several straps secure his body to the gurney. He other, utters another unintelligible statement. Defense attorney Dean Sanderford is quietly crying in the observation area. Why do they bury lawyers under 20 feet of dirt? Because deep down, they're really good people. What's the difference between a tick and a lawyer? A tick falls off when you're dead. 6.38 p.m., Lockett is grimacing, grunting, and lifting his head and shoulders entirely up from the gurney. He begins rolling his head from side to side. He again mumbles something we can't understand except for the word man. He lifts his head and shoulders off the gurney several times as if he's trying to sit up. He appears to be in pain. The risk that an error administering sodium thanopol would go undetected is minimal, Kentucky urges, because if the drug were mistakenly injected into the inmate's tissue, not a vein, he would be awake and screaming. See brief for respondents 42, brief for state of Texas et al. as amicus curi 26 to 27. 6.39 p.m. The physician walks around to Lockett's left arm, lifts up the sheet, and says something to Trammell. We're going to lower the blinds temporarily, she says. The blinds are lowered and we can't see what's happening. Reporters exchange shocked glances. Nothing like this has happened at an execution any of us has witnessed since 1990, when the state resumed executions using lethal injection. It is not a little ironic and telling that lethal injection hailed just a few years ago as the human humane alternative in light of which every other me 
of, of execution was deemed an unconstitutional relic of the past is the subject of today's challenge. It appears the Constitution is evolving even faster than expected. How do lawyers sleep? They lie on one side, then lie on the other. What do lawyers do after they die? They lie still. 6.40 p.m. A black line line phone rings in the viewing chamber and Patton leaves to take the call, stretching the phone cord out into the hall and closing the door behind him. Though the clock on one wall in the execution chamber is no longer visible, it seems like several minutes pass before Thompson is summoned out to the hallway. 1842, shades lowered, phlebotomist and doctor check IV. We have neither the authority nor the expertise to micromanage the state's administration of the death penalty in this manner. There is simply no reason to believe that unelected judges without scientific, medical, or peniological training are any better suited to resolve the delicate issues surrounding the administration of the death penalty than our straight administrative personnel specifically charged with the task. CF Ante at 1545. How can you tell a lawyer is lying? Other lawyers look interested. 1844 to 1856. The doctor checked the IV and reported the blood vein had collapsed, and the drugs had either absorbed into the tissue, leaked out, or both. The warden immediately contacted the director by phone and reported the information to the director. The director asked the following question, have enough drugs been administered to cause death? The doctor responded, no. The director asked, is another vein available, and if so, are there enough drugs remaining? The doctor responded no to both questions. The director requested clarification as to whether enough drugs had been administered to cause death. The doctor responded no. The director asked the condition of the offender. The warden responded the doctor was checking the offender's heartbeat and found a faint heartbeat and the offender was unconscious. Little need to be said here other than to refer to the various opinions filed by my colleagues today. Under the competing risk standards advanced by the plurality opinion and the dissent, for example, the difference between a lethal injection that satisfies the Eighth Amendment and one that does not may well come down to one's judgment with respect to something as hair-splitting as whether an eyelash stroke is necessary to ensure that the inmate is unconscious or whether instead other measures have already provided sufficient assurance of unconsciousness. Compare post at 1569 1570, Ginsburg dissenting. Approximately 6.50 p.m., Patton comes back in the viewing room and says the execution has been stopped. We've had a vein failure in which the chemicals did not make it into the offender. Under my authority, we are issuing a stay for the second execution. This announcement is stunning and leaves us wondering what happened to Lockett. Capital punishment jokes, it's all in the execution. 1856, director calls off execution under authority granted by the governor. In other words, an isolated mishap alone does not give rise to an Eighth Amendment violation, precisely because an such an event, while regrettable, does not suggest cruelty or that the procedure at issue gives rise to a substantial risk of serious harm. It at 842, 1114, Supreme Court, 1970. Whatever little light our prior method of execution cases might shed is thus dimmed by the passage of time. We are told to leave the viewing chamber and are escorted to a waiting white prison van. We have to tear the notes out of the spiral notebook and leave it plus the pen behind. How many lawyers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Two, one to screw it in, one to sue the other for screw screwing it in wrong. How many lawyers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Just one. A lawyer will screw anything. How many lawyers does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many can you afford? In Gregg versus Georgia, 428 U.S. 153, 96 Supreme Court, 2909, 49 Lawyers Edition 2nd, 859, 19, 
76, we explained that unless a criminal sanction serves a legitimate penological function, it constitutes gratuitous infliction of suffering in violation of the Eighth Amendment. We then identified three social purposes for the death as sanction, incapacitation, deterrence, and retribution. How many lawyers does it take to screw in a light bulb? I cannot recall this answer at this particular time. 1906, doctor pronounces offender Lockett deceased. 1706, Lockett is pronounced dead in the execution chamber from a heart attack. The news of his death is provided to reporters by Patton during a brief statement at the media center on prison grounds. He explains to reporters that prison officials do not know how much of the second and third drugs entered Lockett's body. Don't admit, blame me. I don't make the laws. I just circumvent them. Thrice the court has considered a challenge to a modern method of execution, and thrice it has rejected the challenge, each time emphasizing that the Eighth Amendment is aimed at methods of execution purposefully designed to inflict pain. There is no reason to suppose that today's decision will be any different. His line failed, Patton says. When asked what that means, Patton adds, his vein exploded. The defense attorney was in the final summation of his case. And if it pleased the court, if I am wrong in this, I have another argument that is equally conclusive. Judge under the proper standard, this is an easy case. I'm the next guy up. Am I going to get all screwed up in here? Are they going to screw it up? What's the difference between a lawyer and God? God doesn't know he's a lawyer. How many lawyer jokes are there? Only three. The rest are true stories.